Y en esta semana vamos a tener una conversación muy interesante con un invitado muy especial. Su nombre es Steven Pinecker y él tiene un canal de YouTube en inglés que trata en cuanto a cosas de la Iglesia de Jesucristo, de los santos de los últimos días y otras cosas. Ahorita vamos a ver qué. Pero su historia es interesante, ya que no es el típico miembro activo de la iglesia. Entonces, esa entrevista va a estar en inglés. La vamos a subtitular, de igual forma que con algunas pasadas, y nos pueden seguir desde casa. Así que, sin más que decir, démosle la bienvenida a Steve. Welcome. Thank you for being on the channel today. Hola. Uh, uh, gracias. Uh... Now you could call me Esteban if you want. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I was just telling our viewers uh, that you have a channel. I didn't go into too much detail, uh, but could you tell us a little bit about how, what you do on YouTube? So a little over two years ago, I uh, started this YouTube channel, um, YouTube podcast called Mormon Book Reviews. And uh, the reason why I started it was because I consumed a lot of media Uh, a lot of different Mormon podcasters, uh, some very popular ones. Some are uh, faithful, others maybe not so faithful, uh, but I, I would watch many of them to get kind of a, because I was interested in Mormonism. And uh, so I started this little channel and I just thought I was just going to be reviewing books in my book collection uh, that I've been accumulating since I was like in high school. Um, and I just thought that's what I'd be doing. But it quickly became an interview program And I thought maybe I'd occasionally would have guests on that. Now it's primarily become a uh, channel where I interview different guests. Many of them are the authors of the books that I have in my collection. I did not expect that to happen. And so then uh, I've then since branched out to interview, uh, do general media as well, or we, anything like Mormon movies, uh, TV shows, plays. Uh, so we have the movie directors come on the program. And so we also have been uh, branched off into doing anything that's cult anything has to do with LDS culture, um, whether it's books, movies, TV shows. Uh, we 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 cover that on the program as well. <clears throat> so that that kind of gives you a little gist of just the channel as it's currently constructed. You know, and, and something interesting about your channel is that, uh, you know, if someone looks at the interview or even looks at the channel, uh, one might say, I bet he was a stake president a few years ago, or I bet he went on a mission to Florida. So could you tell us a little bit about your relationship with the church? Yeah, so that's the interesting thing is that I am an evangelical Christian. I have never been a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but I've been interested in it since I was a young child. And I just have i will tell you that probably when i was younger i would probably be considered anti-mormon and that much of the book collecting i was doing and researching was to kind of do anti-mormon apologetics <laughs> but then as i engaged the materials i started to really kind of like a lot of people a lot of the people including people like joseph smith and here reading books like rough stone rolling and no man's knows my history Um, they kind of really fleshed out Joseph, made him into a human being. And so I start my 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 heart started to turn away from it be bashing and negative towards the church and be more neutral, uh, which that's why they call my channel the Switzerland of Mormonism, because it's it it truly is probably about the only neutral Mormon podcast, because I don't belong to the anti-Mormon group or the faithful Mormon group. I am, I don't go, I, I'm an actual outsider. So that's why I can have very prominent uh, ex-Mormons come on, on the program and very prominent um, uh, faithful Mormons come on the program, but also very prominent evangelicals and also even prominent atheists come on my program because I was an atheist for like 12 years. So that's another part of my story. But yeah, so I, I, because of where I'm positioned, it puts me in a very unique place where people from all sides trust me and know that they're going to get a fair hearing on my program. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it does. In, in fact, that's pretty interesting. I've watched uh, many of your videos, and I've seen that you uh, pretty much interview uh, all sorts of people <laughs> regarding um, the restoration. No, I think that a part of your channel, you say, when an evangelical amidst the restoration. Yep. Uh, so... And I also say all the voices of the restoration will be heard on Mormon book reviews. And I and I think it's a very important thing for people to realize that, you know, even if you're 
not a member of the church anymore, you're still in one sense a Mormon. And so, and you are still a voice. And so it's important that we hear all the different voices and that people then can even hear maybe from an ex-Mormon on my channel. They may not watch their program, but they'll watch them on my program. And it, it just it helps increase understanding amongst the different groups and gets people talking to each other, which I think is very, very important. <laughs> and, you know, when you say that, um, you know, uh, seeing some people, I see how they can react both positive and negatively. On the positive side, uh, and I'm in that spectrum, I think it's really refreshing to to have dialogue with people who we don't necessarily agree with, but in a way that we don't really have to debate or debunk each other. And on the negative side, some people might say, uh, like, you're not even a member, so why, why even get involved? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my question for you is when, I mean, you could do a channel on evangelical Christianity, or you could do a channel on different religions. Uh, so what has inspired you to focus on the Latter-day Saint movement? Yeah, you're right. You're actually correct about that, because not only did I study the Latter-day Saint tradition, um, but I also studied all different religions, especially Western religions. Um, uh, but I, I will tell you that in my study of all the different groups, I always went back to Mormonism. I always found Mormon history and the story to be so compelling in a way that I don't see in any other group. So uh, that my interest has always been primarily in 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 the, the Latter Day Saint tradition and its history. And you know, just giving an example, I just attended the Mormon History Association conference. You know, this is a bookmark from it. Uh, so I'm very I'm a member of the Mormon History Association. I'm going to be presenting in Texas near Austin this fall at the John Whitmer Historical Association. Um, and so I just find the topic the most interesting. I could have done, and I said, why do you ask, like, why do I not just do a channel about evangelicalism or religion in general? Well, there's plenty of people who are doing channels about evangelicalism. And there's plenty of evangelicals who are doing anti-Mormon stuff. And I feel like, why would I want to do something that everybody else is doing? Plus, I'm not anti-Mormon. So I felt like I'm just positioned in a very unique place to actually do a fair and balanced treatment of the subject. And, and I will tell you, I get very, very little criticism from people because it, even people who hate each other will s still come in agreement that I'm fair. Even people that disagree with each other will say, yeah, well, Steve's fair. And I've been an arbor I've been somebody who's kind of been uh, a person who's kind of helped settle disputes between people, get people on Zoom calls to kind of hash things out, people that haven't talked to each other in 10 or 15 years, and just have conversations in which we can try to build bridges and that kind of stuff. So I think my neutrality is so important. And I think, honestly, to be honest with you, dude, I do believe that God's hand is on this endeavor. I, I tell people, if, God, if man couldn't plan it, then God probably did. I would not have imagined two years ago that this channel would have become the channel that it's become. It's really remarkable. A little over two and a half years ago, I didn't even know a single member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Not a single one. I didn't know anybody. And nobody knew me. And within this relatively short period of time, I'm very I'm well known in a lot of a lot of the circles that I think it's great to be well known in the more, the scholarly community. I had a, a a professor from Brigham Young University come to me at Mormon History Association and says, "Steve, we love you at BYU. All the professors watch your program." And that's fascinating to me. And then I just recently had Robin Jensen and his crew on with the Joseph Smith Papers Project. These people work in the church historian department. These are church employees. And they were excited to come on my program to talk about the final volume of the Joseph Smith Papers Project. So we did like an overview. And so to be able to realize that I have a lot of credibility, the channel has a lot of credibility in the scholarly community um, really means a lot to me. And it's become now the, the place for cutting edge, like what is the latest thing happening in Mormonism? They're coming on my channel. When the Joseph Smith paper, when the Joseph Smith photo came out, I was the very first interview, you know, uh, to interview the person, one of the co-authors of the paper, who was Lachlan Mackay, who's an apostle in the community of Christ, and he's a direct descendant of Joseph Smith. And so I, so within 24 hours of that new photo being announced to the world, I have, I have this exclusive interview with one of the key people in, in, in identifying the Joseph Smith photograph. And then recently I had another individual come on who's an independent researcher who shed more light on the photo. 
And that's become my most viewed video. Uh, so when it comes to breaking news, the latest in Mormon scholarship, um, this is the place that people go to have these conversations. Um, it, it, I, I, the, my, I, I get cited in, in papers and in books. Um, I helped identify the oldest piece of Book of Mormon artwork, uh, uh, the, uh, the oldest painting ever of a Book of Mormon story I identified as being the oldest, and the church had it in its own archives. So if you go to the Book of Mormon art catalog, you'll find that the paintings I identified are listed first, uh, 1871. And, and, then, uh, and then recently, when I was in, in, in Independence, Missouri, uh, the mission president and I drove 30 minutes to go to this gentleman's house who had the rarest Book of Mormon in the world that we did not even know existed. And so to be to hold that edition in my hands, this, this Book of Mormon that nobody knew from Bo Robert of Book of Mormon Editions YouTube channel, never heard of this edition. So we we're very excited to have the person who owns it on the program and had Robert come on as my co-host. So it's not only is a place where, um, where we talk about the scholarship, it's a place where actually we are um, kind of influencing the trajectory of, 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 Mormon history in some sense, because if this channel didn't exist, I don't know a lot of these things would have come, would have happened. And so that's just a crazy thing to just jump in this world and have the impact that it's had. It's pretty amazing to me. Sorry, that was a long answer, but I hope it answered. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. In fact, um, you know, uh, first of all, I think that you recently uh, hit 5,000 subscribers. So congratulations on that. Yeah. And you know, now that you're mentioning uh, what you've done and how you got this, got to see this copy of the Book of Mormon and the Joseph Smith Papers project. So, in in Latin America, it's pretty common that when you mention Joseph Smith or the Book of Mormon, that's really in, almost immediately linked to uh, the devil or a scam. No, <laughs> in fact. Um, in this past year, <laughs> look at something look like at, that. Look at him. Look at him. Look at Emma's face. <laughs> this is this is an anti-Mormon comic book. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. evangelicals. This is what the, this is what they think of Joseph Smith. This is what they think. Enchanter, uh, con man. Uh, you know, yeah, of the devil. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, in fact, in this past year, there's there's been a few ads from come unto christ that pop up on youtube and to be honest i think that campaign should last um maybe a couple of weeks or a month or it's been more than a year so because of that people keep getting the ads on their feet and they are getting a bit tired of it including myself <laughs> so um i've seen videos that address uh, these issues and i remember that i watched one a few months ago and then mention how it was it came from a pastor and he said oh uh, those elders and sisters they might be smiling they might be saying that uh, they have something from god to teach you but in fact uh, you need to stay away from them and everything they need to say is poison mm -hmm. and so uh, that's sort of the understanding of the gospel it's pretty much linked to a different gospel as mentioned in the Bible. So uh, when you mentioned Joseph and the Book of Mormon, uh, I see you don't have a an antagonistic view of those topics. So what are your views on Joseph and the Book of Mormon? Yeah, you know, it's fascinating. I take a I take a, a much different approach to Joseph uh and the Book of Mormon than most people do. Uh, my 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 belief is is that Joseph Smith and the 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 the, the restoration is birthed directly out of the second great awakening of culture, the evangelical culture. And and so basically you're birthed out of our movement. You're very much influenced. You know, Joseph Smith was a as a young man was a Methodist exhorter, where and what is a Methodist exhorter? Where uh the pastor gives a sermon and then then the exhorter comes up and kind of riffs on the sermon that was given. And that might do like maybe an altar call to ask people to come and become born again Christians. So he was actively involved in the evangelical church. A lot of people don't realize that. The other thing is, is I do believe that <clears throat> what would later be called the first vision, I do believe was what we would call a born again experience. So I believe that Joseph Smith became a born again Christian at the age of 14. Okay. 
And so now we have a born again Christian young man who really is, I believe, sincere in his faith. Okay. And then we have um, this audacious thing happen. We have a claim that these in ancient records are found of a lost civilization. And that it turns out that we have this civilization that was uh, very Christian, or at least was aware of Christian doctrine, was aware of Jesus, and makes the bold claim that Jesus came and visited them after his uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And so now I engage the actual text of the Book of Mormon. So this is what evangelicals fail to understand, that the Book of Mormon is perhaps the most Christian book ever written on American soil, and that the Book of Mormon is a thoroughly Protestant, Pentecostal doc uh, a document, and that the doctrine that is taught in the Book of Mormon is very much in line with conventional evangelical Protestant Christianity. So the actual content of the Book of Mormon is dare I say, biblical. And so because of that, I don't look at the Book of Mormon as one as anything that's satanic. It's not. I consider it to be a Christian book. And I do think that the doctrines that are taught in the Book of Mormon, for the most part, are very solid. And actually, in many ways, it's more, the Book of Mormon uh, is actually more Trinitarian than the actual original manuscript, New Testament manuscript. So you can make an argument in favor of the Trinity within the pages of the Book of Mormon. And I also think that it teaches a conventional view of God. And the Book of Mormon tells us that, that God is a spirit, right? The Book of Mormon tells us that Jesus and God are one. There's, the, the Book of Mormon tells us that Jesus is God. Well, this is solid doctrine. But not only that, what became so fascinating is my good friend, Dr. Christopher Thomas, who is a Pentecostal theologian, one of the most, one of the most respected Pentecostal theologians in the world, okay? Um, and he wrote this book called A Pentecostal Reads the Book of Mormon, okay? And he did a textual uh, uh, analysis of the Book of Mormon. And uh, what he found was that we have fully developed Pentecostal doctrine in the Book of Mormon that nobody even realized. Now, when I say that, what do you mean, Steve? Well, what I'm saying is, there was this Pentecostalism started in 1906 in a, at Azusa Street in Southern California. Okay, it's Los Angeles. And guess what? It was white people, it was Mexicans, it was black people, and it was Armenians, uh, the people from Armenia. All got together, multiracial. And this great move of God happened in 1906. And now it is one of the, it's the fastest growing segment of Christianity there's over a half a billion people of the part of the Pentecostal charismatic movement in which I identify with, and by the middle of this century will be bigger than Islam. But we there's there is but the, when the Azusa Street happened in 1906, you had the Assemblies of God, Church of God, Church of the Four Square, all these Pentecostal denominations sprung out of it, and they started developing Pentecostal doctrine. Well, it turns out that we thought was uh, kind of original to the the Zuzu street well guess what that fully developed pentecostal doctrine finds its way in the pages of the book of mormon predating azusa street so he, here we, that's a fascinating thing like how do we get around that how do we explain that and so that's what that so now we now we can also look at the book of mormon as really part of the pentecostal charismatic tradition it actually predates it but has fully formed pentecostal doctrine in it that we thought didn't exist at previous to 1906. So that's pretty remarkable. So that gives us another another area in which we can have conversations, especially Pentecostals and Charismatics with the Book of Mormon and the believers of the Book of Mormon. And for example, in this part that you mentioned, Pentecostal uh, aspects in the Book of Mormon, as you mentioned, this can uh, lead to conversations between uh, two groups and two beliefs. So just as an example, uh, can you tell us uh, some of the Pentecostal Coastal aspects that you find in the Book of Mormon. Just some examples. So, uh, being baptized in fire, fire, fire baptism is is kind of uh, fully more fully developed in the Book of Mormon. That would later then be more that that the Azusa Street people would start talking about as well. Um, we have what uh, instances of people being slain in the spirit 
uh, where they're, that's the term we use, where they're, they're knocked out. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and they, and they have these spiritual experiences. Um, we have, uh, just in, in, in addition to the idea of Pentecostal doctrine, we also have a lot of born again doctrine about being born again, people having these, uh, experiences where they become born again, Christians, uh, a born again experience. So again, these are all modern, uh, these are all very familiar things to a Pente somebody from the Pentecostal tradition. Uh, uh, oh, and also one of the key doctrines that also talks about in the Book of Mormon, the Pentecostal wise, is baptism of the Holy Spirit and evidence of tongues. Tongues would be evidence of baptism in the Holy Spirit, which becomes kind of a key doctrine in many of the Pentecostal traditions in the, in the world today. So you you have a, a further development of Pentecostal doctrine that isn't that, that is new to to in this world. These these are these are doctrines that would later be developed in, in later in the in the 20th century. Interesting. And and you know now that you mentioned this and the fact that there can be this dialogue with the contents of the book, I think that's something that both members and non-members can think. It's that if I don't believe something it's true and literally happened uh, how does it benefit me so uh, for example a Latter day saint may believe may say i don't believe in the quran for example so i don't think it's true so if i read it it's just like reading fiction so what's the benefit of it so i think that for example and a christian can look at the book of mormon and say well i don't believe that I don't necessarily believe that Nephi existed or that uh, Captain Moroni led a war. So if I don't believe it's literal history, how can I still find benefit? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good question. I think that the benefit is this, quite simply. Let's just talk purely naturalistically, okay? Like, let's just say that the Book of Mormon is not supernatural, but was cre it's a 19th century creation. The, one of the benefits that you will get out of the Book of Mormon is that um, in during the Second Great Awakening period, which is pivotal in American history, all right, um, you would have these re revival preachers giving sermons, and they would be off the cuff; they wouldn't be planned, and they would be uh, and they would speak, and they would they would construct these tall stands, and they would get up. And they would exhort the people often in 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 the outdoor setting. Okay, well, we don't have transcripts of these sermons. Guess what? We have them in the Book of Mormon. King Benjamin's speech is a classic 19th century Second Great Awakening sermon. So, as a evangelical who just wants to engage the text, if you actually want to experience a 19th century Second Great Awakening service. And its environment, it's all there in King Benjamin's speech, and so to me that is a benefit, a historical benefit. And so that, that and, and again, you and, and again, we can also make the argument that let's just say that the Book of Mormon is also supernaturally inspired. It still goes through the mind of the translator Joseph Smith. So when he is engaging the text of the Book of Mormon, he is going to be influenced by the 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 language and the culture and the milieu that he grew up in. So when he's reading King Benjamin's text, he's going to then be using 19th century uh, revival language because that would have been familiar to him as a translator because all, all translations have bear the marks of the translator. And so you actually have this opportunity to realize that Joseph, because he heard all these sermons, he's like, oh, this King Benjamin, he sure sounds like that Methodist exhort preacher I heard. And so it's going to be in a Methodist preacher's uh, type of a, a way of presentation. So that's how we can engage the text on multiple levels. One, is it just a 19th century creation? Well, maybe it is. But is it a 19th century creation that that that, that is based on an older text, but it's going to be filtered through the eyes and ears and the understanding of somebody in the 19th century setting? Even Brigham Young said, if we had the Book of Mormon today came forth, it would be a different, it would be different than the one that came out. He even recognized that the role of the translator and the, the, the time and place that you're in is going to influence the text. Uh, so does that, you know, does that make sense? So now, so now there's a benefit that an evangelical can can can, can uh, engage the text of the Book of Mormon, recognizing that this is a valuable document just in a purely his, secular historical context as well.
Yeah, yeah, I think that's important to understand it. And I think that uh, even leads us to our, our next question that uh, there's this uh, playground in which uh, we can uh, learn and, and understand and talk to each other in, in this context that even though some may take it as the word of God of divine nature and some may take it as a 19th century text uh, that also can a lead to, as you mentioned previously, that the Latter-day Saint movement does not necessarily just involve the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So mm -hmm. there are other uh, branches of the church, uh, sometimes they're not really well known, mm -hmm. and sometimes members just pretend like they don't exist. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your experience with these different branches of the Latter-day Saint movement? Sure, sure. So um, <clears throat> the first group that I got involved with before I even started the channel was the Community of Christ, which used to be called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in 2001, they changed their name to Community of Christ. And that is Joseph Smith's family's church. Uh, so up until recently, the prophet, seer, and revelator of that church was a direct descendant of Joseph Smith. Okay, uh, their, their emeritus, their, their president emeritus is still a direct descendant of Joseph uh, Smith. And so or patriarch, I forget exactly what his title is. <clears throat> so I first engaged them when I was doing a, um, a uh, well, let me see if I can see the book. Uh, oh yeah, here. So <clears throat> again, I hadn't started my channel yet, but uh, I saw on Reddit that they were going to be doing a, uh, a book club every Thursday, and they're going to read through the book, uh, Joseph Smith III, Pragmatic Prophet, and this was written by Roger D. Lanius, who, by the way, I've had on my program uh, twice now. Um, and no, just one time. No, I did twice. Two times, Roger, I've had him on. And um, and he did this biography that was written in the 1980s. So every Thursday, I would hop into this group and say, hi, I'm your evangelical interloper. Uh, and there were about 100 people on the Zoom call. Well, that's where Lock, that's where I met Lachlan Mackay and Barbara Walden and people part of the historians department of the Community of Christ. And that was my first engagement at all was Community of Christ. So I thought initially, well, maybe I'll just be like focused on the Community of Christ and kind of make that kind of like one of my basis you know. And then I next thing you know, and a few months later, I start engaging people of the Church of Jesus Christ. And they're 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 the what I call the Pentecostal uh, Pentecostal believers in the Book of Mormon. And their founding prophet was William Bickerton. And uh, this is called William Bickerton, Forgotten Later, Latter-day Prophet. And it's written by Daniel Stone, who's a member of the church. And I've had him on my program as well. And William Bickerton, they're the third largest group. So the, so the, the, the Community of Christ is the second largest branch of the Restoration. And then the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ is the third largest branch of the Restoration. And they are based in Monagahilla, Pennsylvania, is their headquarters. And by the way, they have many, many congregations in Mexico. They're actually flourishing in Mexico. And so they actually have a, a, a large presence there. And also they have a large presence, I believe, in Guatemala. And so those are two groups that I <clears throat> started engaging with. And then I started engaging with smaller groups, some that might be only have a couple dozen members. An example would be Matthew Gill has a church uh, in England. Um, it called, was originally called the Latter-day Church of Jesus Christ, but the, there was a lawsuit from the, the, the church starting a lawsuit, so he changed the name. Uh, but Matthew Gill is the prophet, seer, and revelator of their group, and they have an interesting scripture, and I'm going to get it out of my bookshelf here. Now, because of the green screen, it probably won't show up too well, but this is the Chronicles of the Children of Aranek. And originally, he, he translated a book called the Book of uh, Jeranek, and then he would later get, uh, and those were those were plates. So he translated plates, and this 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 purports to be the history of the people who built Stonehenge, and these were people that were related to the Jaredites, and they actually uh, fled the the Tower of Babel and made their way to England, and would be the people that would build the 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 um, Stonehenge. So this is the scriptures that he translated, and so like I said. I've known about him for like 15 years. Nobody ever heard of him. So I like to find the people that nobody's ever even heard of. And then I also, another group, of course, you would be familiar, of course, in Mexico, which would be the polygamists. And uh, they're they're quite active in, in your country as well. And I b became friends with uh, people who practice uh, the principle, as they call it. 
And uh, I've had Benjamin Schaefer come on my program. Um, I've had uh, Anne Wilde come on my program, who was the first polygamous wife of the very influential um, uh, fundamentalist, I call him fundamentalist theologian, uh, Ogden Kraut. And so that what's been the big surprise for me is my engagement also with um, Mormon fundamentalism and find that the people are just awesome. They're not, see, people get misunderstand. They think Mormon polygamy, they think FLDS, Warren Jeffs. That is a distortion. That is what happens when man uh, the, the corrupts things. He, they corrupted the ideals, the, uh, the I would say in one sense, I, ideally uh, Mormon f polygamy sh can, and be, can be ethical as long as you're not marrying off children and all these kind of things, and these are consenting adults. Um, that group did not do the such thing. So I would never talk to FL. I would never have like people that would have child brides. I would not have them on my program. But I would I engage what I would call ethical um, polygamists and have <clears throat> and have them on my program. So th that's why I said earlier all the voices of the restoration are heard on my channel. I really mean that when I say that. So if you are a if you believe that Joseph Smith was your founding prophet, and you have the Book of Mormon as your scriptures. That's the, that to me automatically uh, includes I include you in the group of people that I would like to engage. Thank you. And, you know, when you mentioned that there's something that can be maybe bothering to both members and non-members of the church. And I'll do my best to try to uh, phrase it. Uh, but it's something that I noticed um, uh, myself. I went on a faith crisis when I was a teenager uh, so I think that it's common knowledge that once you start questioning uh, the church's truth claims, there is really no reason why you shouldn't also question truth claims in general. So mm -hmm. sometimes people start questioning Christianity as well. And, mm -hmm. and that's why many of the people who can end up leaving the church can become agnostic or, or atheist. Mm -hmm. You know, some, some remain Christian. Um, but something that I've noticed is that, for example, in this case with the Lara the Insane movement, I think that as members of the church, and I don't know if the other members think that, but that's something that came to my mind as I was uh, listening to, to what you were saying. Sometimes we don't want to think that there are other people who believe in the Book of Mormon and that Joseph Smith was a prophet, because if there's more people like us that we don't believe, uh, uh, maybe are the church of Jesus Christ, then we are no longer, I don't know if the word special right. <laughs> is, you know, and we're just one of the bunch, you know? Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, if, if the Lerdes movement just came out of the second great awakening, then we're just one of the bunch. There's nothing really special. And if we translate that to Christianity, uh, you know, there's this argument that there are many uh, cultures that talk about a flood or many cultures that talk about a savior being born of a virgin. Uh, so when you look at Christianity with those les lenses, then it's, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is just one of the bunch. There's nothing special about this. So some people can come to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. And you as a Christian on the Christian spectrum, for example, how do you reconcile and how do you think members can reconcile being strong in their beliefs while also being open to other cultures coming to similar conclusions? I think uh, man, uh, we, we, we all, uh, one, of the, one of the evolutionary advantage, advantages is that humans had was that we, got, we, 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 we hung around in clans and tribes. So we formed these communities that gave us an advantage over any of the other um, uh, any of the other animals in the in the in the, uh, in, in, the, in, the in the animal kingdom, and so that's why we're able to build these sophisticated societies. But one of the downsides of tribalism and clan clanism is that you tend to be very suspicious of outsiders, which can be helpful for survival. But as but also the, so in one sense that's what got us here. But we also have to kind of try to tamp down those immediate responses to people that are different from each other and, and to recognize that we're all, we all share a common humanity with each other and that we all are part of the same 
human family, even though we're div divvied up. So I think most people feel comfortable being in their in-group. And they feel very uncomfortable when they're dealing with people that are a lot like them, but aren't them. And that's where like the familiarity ble breeds contempt. Uh, I think that's why you see there, there, there's like, for instance, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is making a lot of efforts to uh, ingratiate themselves to the broader Protestant and Christian community. They want to be accepted and called Christians, right? And they want to say, hey, we've been, we've been uh, mistreated or we would like to show you that we are also fellow Christians. But they won't then at the same time extend the same uh, thing that they would like to have. They won't extend that to the other groups. <laughs> and, and, and so to me, that's kind of a little hip, hip, hypocritical that on one hand, they want to be accepted, but yet they're the ones that want to make sure that, no, I, we don't we don't have, want to have anything. But the president of the community of Christ and the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, ha have not met in a very, very long time. They don't even, the church, the Utah church doesn't even, hardly acknowledges the RLDS community of Christ in many ways. And I think like all this ecumenical talk of ecumenicism, uh, where they want to engage other Christian groups, is fine, but I would also say that the church also needs to do the same within the context of the restoration. When people say, well, we're so much bigger, we're bigger, why should we worry about the smaller groups? Well, I'm like, well, I'm an outsider, I'm neutral. Everybody, every why is why should I take your truth claims, but not uh, pay attention to the truth claims that all the other groups are making? Because all these other groups are saying, we're the one true church, we have the priesthood. If the biggest is the, is the if, if being the biggest one is what qualifies you, then I'll be like, well, then what about the Catholics? They're bigger than everybody else. Maybe they're the true church then, right? So the size of the church does not, is not a compelling argument to me. Because throughout much of Christian history, the idea of there being a remnant, a small group of believers that are holding on, is also part of the Christian tradition as well. So I, I don't go by and say, well, I'm only going to pay attention to the one big group and ignore everybody else. Because I'm like, no, there's very interesting stories, that undertold stories of the restoration that people have never heard of these groups. They never heard their stories. And I think it's important that people hear other groups that have been influenced by the Book of Mormon and by Joseph Smith and their prophets. And I find that to be truly fascinating. So I hope I answered your question there. Yes. Yes, I think that, uh, for example, in my case, that's a very, that's a subject I haven't really touched upon that much. Um, I served a mission in Tijuana, and there were some people, I honestly don't know which group they belong to, mm -hmm. uh, but they had a community in a place called Ensenada, and there were street names, I think one of them was Zarahambla and <laughs> things like that, so mm -hmm. I knew they were there, yep. but I I don't really know much else. Uh, yeah. Other missionaries have been found them on the street, and they would say, oh, you are... Uh, Brighamites, I think that's mm -hmm. what they call them, and and there were there was always this, I don't know, this wall. So it's interesting to understand the different branches and you know the yeah, There's a there's a fascinating that. history, a fascinating history of these other sects and groups within uh, within uh, uh, Mexico. And here here's a good book. Um, this I had this author on. It's called Liminal Sovereignty: uh, Mennonites and Mormons in Mexican Culture. And Rebecca Jansen wrote it. She's a Mennonite. And she talked about the the, the colonies, the Mormon colonies. And, 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 and when we say Mormon, it's both uh, uh, polygamists and also regular Latter-day Saints. Um, that she talks about the, 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 the way colonial, uh, the Mormonism and stuff and, and Mennonites are received in the broader Mexican culture. And it is a fascinating story because you have... And then in the 1940s, you had this group, oh, I forget the name, Thomas Murphy did a thing on on uh, Mormonism Live um, called the convention, Second Convention, I forget, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on this, but there was a rift between the Mexican LDS Church and the United States one because of the lack of leadership, Mexican leadership within the church. And so there was actually kind of like a split between the two groups for a while. They reconciled, but then there were some groups that continued the split and went off. So you, you it, it's really... I actually want to spend more time on studying the history of Mormonism in Mexico because it, it's fascinating stuff. But yeah, again, you hardly know anything about it. Why? Because you guys had to wear your blinders because we're in our group. We're in our little in-group and we can't talk to anybody else. And I'm like, I'll talk to them <laughs> and I'll engage them because I find it interesting. And yeah, so there's a flourishing, flourishing Mexican community that would call themselves Mormons, believers in the Book of Mormon. And they don't, they're not connected to you guys at all in, in any formal sense. 
yes and you know i i guess i'll look into it i i've heard that they're more on the north side maybe in chihuahua do you want to uh, but i'll i'll look into it i i bet we have some in, in mexico city you need to you need to get one of them on your program as a guest that'd be interesting yeah yeah in fact i saw that you interviewed an apostle a few weeks ago is that correct Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is Adam Stokes, and he's part of the Church of the Assur uh, the uh, Church of Christ, the Assured Way, the Elijah Message, and I, I butchered the name. And uh, yeah, he's he's an apostle in that group. And yeah, so I talked to apostles in all different groups, and they're 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 based out of their headquarters is based in Independence, Missouri. So yeah, it's an apostle. Yeah, I talked to apostles from all the different groups. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's fascinating. But I I I would like to uh, talk to. I think. I think what you need to do is you need to talk to some of those people down there in Mexico. And if any of them are English speakers, uh, we'll help each other out because I'd like to talk to them too. It'd be very interesting to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll make sure to look into that. That sounds very interesting. And, and you know, now that we've mentioned, I, we focus maybe a bit too much on the church. <laughs> I think that we like, sometimes we enjoy when people toot our horn. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. And maybe... It's it's interesting, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes these kinds of conversation aren't possible because uh, on both sides, sometimes we there's many prejudice. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I see someone on the street, and I'm like, uh, maybe missionaries, no, like, hey, and they're like, no, get away from me. My pastor said <laughs> you're dangerous, mm -hmm. no, and, and the other way around. Um, so, as you mentioned, you no, know, and we've talked about uh, the Latter Day Saint movement. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about evangelical uh, Christianity. Okay. And and first of all, I just wanted to ask you, in this world, in this day and age, it's very common to be skeptic. And as I mentioned, as we learn more about science and history, mm -hmm. the things that, I think the term is called God of the gaps. Uh, I think that it was easier to attribute miracles or or natural disasters to God. And as we understand more of the world around us, maybe the need for that God decreases. Mm. So, and in your personal um, story, why choose Jesus? Why believe in Jesus mm. when okay. you could be agnostic or believe in other religions? Right, you know, and I think, and actually that kind of, uh, that's an earlier question, we kind of touched on that too, and I didn't quite address that, so we'll kind of answer both. <clears throat> so, like I said, I was an atheist for, like a dozen years, okay? And so, so I'm studying Mormonism first as an evangelical Christian, then as an atheist, and then back into faith. And look, I've had some of the biggest atheists on YouTube come on my program. I've had Michael Shermer of Skeptic Magazine come on my program. I've had John Perry come on my program who who attended BYU, who's one of the leading, uh, his channel is one of the leading channels that talks about um, biological evolution, okay? And I've had him on my program. And 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 so it's like, I I come to the table with somebody who didn't believe in God, uh, accepted the theory of evolution uh, and understood it as well, more importantly, <clears throat> and um, had a naturalistic, materialistic worldview that did not include anything that would be considered supernatural or invisible. I thought it was, this is it. Okay, so that, that and I still am very much like a skeptic. I still do very much think like an atheist in many ways. And I'm still highly skeptical of people making truth claims. Okay. So the question you have for me is why? Why would I, knowing everything that I know, find my way back into believing again, right? And how how does one even do that? Because I would have said a few years ago that that would not have even been possible, that I would have done that. And I have to say that in one sense, it's because I had uh, what I would say some spiritual things happened to me, and I was not seeking for these spiritual things. They kind of happened, and without me wanting them to happen, without me trying to make them happen, and we can touch on that a little bit. But I also, um, I started, I also, and I guess, let me just give you, I don't really do Christian apologetics that much, because I don't really... Uh, like a lot of it, and and, and and as somebody who was an atheist skeptic, I don't find many of the Christian ap apologists' arguments to be very convincing to me. But I will tell you when you ask the question, why Jesus? I would say that imagine 
somebody from the poorest region of Mexico. In my in my case, I talk about like West Virginia. Like imagine somebody from West Virginia or somebody from like the 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 like the most backwoods, backward looking, illiterate sections of Mexico, right? And there's this guy that comes out of it, this individual comes out of this community and fundamentally changes the world. And we change our calendars to reflect the day he was born. That's how improbable Jesus is. That that there is a guy who comes from the backwoods of the backwoods of the Roman Empire, the backwoods of Israel, and he is uh, com- comes from uh, just poor people, you know, or they're kind of looked down upon. Um, and he is this, and what we can when we can all attest to this. There was this man named Yeshua, and he was a itinerant preacher who was preaching the imminent destruction of the temple. A Bart Ehrman, an atheist, would, would get, grant you every one of those things. And by golly, that temple did get destroyed, and just as he was predicting. So fundamentally, the world changes because of this guy, that the most improbable human being to ever exist, fund, fundamentally changes the history and ultimately conquers the most popular, most powerful empire in the world. And it and fundamentally changes um Judaism as well, because Judaism is it was centered on sacrifices at the temple, but yet for whatever reason, it's no longer theologically important to Jews to have a temple sacrifices. Why is that? Well, maybe because there's something that happened with this improbable event. And then what happens is you have people who knew him, Jews who were monotheists, who went to the temple, okay, every Sabbath, who believed in Jesus and believed that he was God. And they're praying to they're they're praying to Jesus. Now, why does the Apostle Paul, later the Apostle Paul, at the time, Saul, why is he persecuting Christians? Why? Because they're praying to Jesus, and that's blasphemy, because they believe that Jesus is God. Why would Jewish people who are thoroughly monotheistic, who are, are faithful Jews, would put their necks on the line by praying to a what Paul would say is a man? And that's verboten. That is forbidden. And yet they do. And then the chief persecutor of these people has an encounter. And then he later becomes the most important Christian uh, ever <clears throat> and writes the most books of the Bible. Well, what's going on here? It's pretty crazy. I don't think that people, people like to give naturalistic explanations and why this could happen. And I just say, listen, this is just too, uh, just too, too improbable for there's something to have had happened. And these are people who believe not only was Jesus God, but they also believe that he rose from the dead. And Paul gives us, within 10, 10 12 years of these events happening, we already have, state, you know, Paul's taken the statements of these people. And he's he's reporting back to us what they believe, and even some of the early doctrines of the church that they're espousing. And this is all an oral culture. He's he's documenting this in his, in his letters. So to me, I don't know. I just think that there's something that happened that causes me to believe that if one, if there is a God, all right, then what is the most likely way that I could, um, because God is unknowable. God is beyond our human comprehension. He's, he is the creator. He, he's, he did everything. And he's beyond anything that we as mere mortals could understand. So all other religions make God almost inaccessible. And you you don't really know it, who, I guess what makes God accessible is because he came down as a man to be so that we could access him and that we could have relationship with him in a way that no other divine um gods have are, are operational so i think that the most if there is a god the most likely um means of being able to be in communion communication with him or have a connection to him is through his son jesus christ this is a long-winded answer but i, I hope that that addresses and, and kind of gives you some context of where i'm coming from yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, as I mentioned, the, the channel is called Faith Journeys. So uh, the purpose is to to, to show uh, people's experiences, people's stories. And sometimes we might agree, sometimes not. Uh, but I just want to make sure that uh, voices are heard, you know, and mm-hmm. that people can feel they can have an unbiased person or a biased person share their experiences and and you can choose to to believe it in and and or not you know um 
I bet there will, there will be many people who may watch this interview and maybe at the part when we discuss the Church of Christ or Community of Christ, they might say, uh, no, no, I think these guys are just <laughs> saying stuff I don't believe in. Mm -hmm. Or um, when they hear your story, they might say, oh, well, I, I don't believe in Christ, so I don't I can't really uh, resonate with this. But the purpose of the channel is not to agree with everyone always right. uh, the purpose is to uh, connect as as human beings and and sometimes maybe the channel is a bit connected to the church and the church's tr truth claims but to me the, the main purpose is this human connection you know mm. um, I, mm. oh I sorry <laughs> go ahead oh no i agree with you and I, I also think too that atheism is also a faith journey you know that we also have to uh, recognize that everybody's at a different place in their lives. And some people are not interested in faith. And so they're not even going to turn us on and watch this. But there are other people who maybe are on a faith journey and maybe they're not sure what they believe anymore. They want to believe in a God, but they don't know how or why. And they're, they're maybe very skeptical of all the truth claims that the various churches make. And I just tell people, I say, you know, Jesus is accessible to you on an individual level. And it doesn't matter what building you go to on Sunday morning. The most important thing is, do you have a personal relationship with the Savior? And so for me, it all just comes down to that. It becomes between you and him and having your relationship. And any man-made institutions are just, the, they, can, they can be helpful to us, but they also can be a hindrance to us as well. The most important thing is to have a relationship personally with the Savior and then let everything else fall and you know, let everything else kind of work its way, uh, work itself out from there. But I think Jesus has to be in the center of the endeavor. And if you do that, I don't think you can go wrong. Okay. And, you know, as we wrap up, uh, we represent uh, evangelicals and, and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this effort to talk to each other, understand each other, what would your advice be for Latter-day Saints? And what would your advice be for evangelicals? I think um, I think there's because there has been this uh, this conflict for over 200 years between evangelicals and the Restoration Latter Day Saints is that neither side really uh, they put they're very defensive, very defensive, and they don't want to. Uh, they're afraid if they let their guard down, they're going to get they're going to get punched or they're going to they're going to lose the argument, all that kind of stuff. And I, and you know, and there's this phrase, uh, the devil is in the details, right? Look for the devil in the details. And that, and that, that, that's what you got to look for when you're dealing with other groups, other people that you don't agree with. And I always tell people, so rather than look for the devil, when you're encountering people that, that are different from you, you need to look for the Jesus. And when you look for the Jesus, you will come, you will find a different way of engaging people and i talk about this i've been on saints unscripted and i've talk, talked about this on a few other programs including mine whereas i have these three questions that i ask tell evangelicals to ask um, latter-day saints and the three questions is one what is your favorite book of mormon story two what is your favorite bible story and three who is jesus to you this is how i want evangelicals to start the conversation with latter-day saints i also would encourage latter-day saints to formulate there are also their questions that they can have with the evangelicals when they you could use two of the three of them and maybe you guys all could think of a third one and that would be what is your favorite bible story and who is jesus to you so then if you start talking about that and then you make jesus the center of the conversation you will find a lot of commonalities with each other and you will be very shocked and surprised to hear how similar we are and how we view jesus and so for me, that's the most important thing is to just let's center it on Jesus and then uh, look at the just look and then look at the Book of Mormon, how Christian it is and how Christ centric it is. It's a beautiful book that evangelicals can embrace and actually um, use as an engage a tool to have engagements with people of the, of, of the Latter-day Saint tradition. Thank you for sharing that. And, and you know. <laughs> I was just planning on, on asking you those three questions. <laughs> Maybe I haven't formulated my own yet, but I'm pretty interested in knowing what's your favorite Bible story, what's your favorite book of Mormon story, and, and who's Jesus to you. Okay. So, oh, that's that's great. You know, I, I should have been prepared for that because I'm, I, uh, Bible stories-wise, I got to think about, 
So I do think that one of the things that I like, and it was identified by Christopher Thomas. And by the way, Christopher Thomas is the president of El Presidente of the Book of Mormon Studies Association, the leading scholarly organization that engages the text of the Book of Mormon. So one of the things I really love about what his discovery therefore makes it the most important story of the Book of Mormon is the story of the anti-Nephi Lehi's bearing their weapons, right? So many would argue that the Book of Mormon is a war document because there's a lot of violence and bloodshed and war. It's a, and, and I tell people, so of course it's going to have a lot of war in it because the uh, the editor was was Mormon and he was a general. <laughs> but but at the very center of the Book of Mormon, we have the story of the bearing of the weapons. And so now we have the Prince of Peace enter into the in, into the conversation of people who essentially are Christ-like that refuse to bear arms. And 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 our our pacifists to turn the other cheek. So I think that that's that's a very instructive story, that even in the midst of a of a of a of a of a war document, if you will, a book that's full of war and violence, we do find a a central central central. So this is the thing, Christopher had them do a textual analysis of the Book of Mormon uh, number counts and found that almost at the exact center of the Book of Mormon is that story, which is significant especially when you're doing a textual analysis. I also will say that I do like the idea of, of the ites, the, go, the no matter of ites, that, the, that we don't have any ites anymore during this, uh, what I call a proto-millennium, this 200 years of peace described in 4th Nephi. And I think that that, I tell people, I spoke at a Book of Mormon rally uh, last month, I said, oh, we have the Josephites, we have the Brighamites, we have the Bickertonites, we have the Cutlerites, we have all these matter of ites within the restoration and the time has come for us to one lay down our arms and to abandon the uh, the ites and look at each other as fellow restorationists so those are two key things of the book of mormon my two key takeaways of the book of mormon okay so now we got to talk about the favorite bible story and that's actually that's a really good question and and I need to think about contemplate this for a minute because there's so much, and it's funny because I never even thought to myself about being asked the questions myself. I think that, well, I think that the centrality of Jesus and the uh, the, the fact that Jesus, I, I look at it this way, Jesus was a, a, a pacifist in many ways. And he told us to turn the other cheek and love your enemies. He also uh, told us to... Um, Pray for those who spitefully use you. Um, he, he, he challenges us by telling us that we need to give away everything if we want to follow him. Um, the message of the Bible is Jesus, but also it's sacrifice, self-sacrifice and dying to oneself. And I think that Jesus is the ultimate example of self-sacrifice and being sacrificial and dying to self, which I think is fundamental as Christians for us to embrace the character of Jesus and what he represents and that he, he did this, uh, this free gift that he gave us, uh, which ultimately is leading to the, uh, which gave us, of course, the atonement. And we also have just the, uh, um, the atonement and the redemption of all of creation. And that is an ongoing process that continues to this day. And we can be participants with the divine and cooperators with the divine as we engage Jesus. So that's not a particular story. I think it's the centrality of Jesus. I quoted some verses um, is, is, is my favorite part of my favorite Bible story. So yeah, it's a Bible story. So then <clears throat> the question is, who is Jesus to you? And again, the kind of, I kind of answered that question, but who is Jesus to me is that he is my Lord and savior. Uh, he is, my, he is my, my King. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and I am grateful for the sacrifice that he did for us at the cross he gave and, and he did it and and, and he, he enabled us to be partakers um a, uh, with with the, the father to be able to one day um be up in 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 the, in the eternities in, in there saying holy 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 is the lamb of god and we will be there at the at the wedding feast uh one day uh, chanting that and who knows where the eternities take us after that so i hope i answered your question there but yeah jesus is uh my lord and savior and he is, uh, in, in every, he's, what he did for us at the cross is open to everyone. It's not just a select few. It's not just a prede predetermined few. It's for all of creation.
Thank you, Steve. Thank you for sharing that. And again, thank you for being on the channel. I think it's been a, a great conversation and um, I personally have learned a lot about this interface dialogue. And I think that many of our viewers can also um, learn a lot from this. Thank so you. thank you for being here today. Oh, and I'm excited about interviewing you. So folks, we're going to, I'm going to interview, we're going to turn the tables. I'm going to interview you later on. <laughs> and I'm excited about that because I learned a lot about you by the questions you asked, because we don't really know each other. So this was, I don't really know you. So this was a really great opportunity for my, me to get to know you a little better too. And thank you so much uh, for having me on your program. This is awesome. No problem. I'll leave a link to your channel in the description. And I'll do this part in Spanish. Uh, a todos ustedes, gracias por eh, ver este capítulo de Viajes FM. De igual forma, si les gustó, pueden darle me gusta, pueden compartirlo o pueden suscribirse. Eh, de igual forma, eh, viene el canal de, de Steve. Tal vez no hay subtítulos, pero los subtítulos automáticos de YouTube suelen ayudar bastante. Y recuerden, al final, el propósito de, de todo este contenido es que el viaje de fe de cada uno de nosotros sea más informado.